Hello and welcome to the Rat Nest Podcast, episode number 33 with Sully. Hey! What up, dude? How's it going? How you doing, bro? Good, it's great yeah. to see you, man. You're looking good. Thank you. Thank you. I'm trying. I'm yeah. Trying. So, uh, yes. you're, you're eating healthy these days. I see you posting shit about your cooking and, and all the, all the shit that you're eating healthy. Just trying to cut out the carbs and sugar, man. You know, just, uh, keep it, keep it as healthy as possible. You know, I, I let myself eat pretty bad twice a week, once, twice a week, but for the rest of it, I just feel a lot better eating, eating a little cleaner, you know, for sure. That's healthy. What do you, what do you think about like the, uh, I don't know. I think it's like a trend. If you're an artist, maybe not a trend, but just almost like a, something that happens naturally where you, you start to want to cook, like you start to want to play with like food and stuff because it is such like a artistic, like outlet. Yeah. I, well, I mean, I've always been, I've always been like, um, wanting to learn stuff in the kitchen. Like even when I was a little kid, like just watching my parents make scrambled eggs, that was the first thing I wanted to make was like scrambled eggs. And then it all started there and just, now it's to the point to where it's if I haven't cooked it and, it, and it's something I like, I'll want to try and cook it and see if I can nail it. And mm. usually within the first three times I make it, I can get it pretty close to how I like it. But yeah, I, I like the creativity or even just being able to see like, I really liked it like this, but I felt it was missing this. So now I can, I, it's in my hands so I can do it this way and then throw in that and see how, if, if I was right, you know, right. or maybe, maybe I was wrong, but. You know, at least you get to try it that way. I like the creative process of cooking as well, too. Yeah, dude, I feel you. Uh, the other day, uh, Matt came down in the morning, and I was like, "Hey, I'll just cook us breakfast, so we don't gotta go nowhere. Like, we got work to do. Uh, I'll just make us some scrambled eggs and bacon real quick." And I, I dropped some vanilla in the eggs, like not thinking, just like, "Hey, let's see what this tastes like," because I don't fucking know my way around a kitchen. I don't cook <laughs> at all. I'm like, I know this shit goes good in breakfast foods, and so I just dropped a little in, and we're eating it. And he goes, hmm. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that's that vanilla. And he goes, there is fucking vanilla in the eggs. What the <laughs> fuck? So, I mean, I don't know. I just create. Try try and did make it, work? it I mean, did it work or was it just? Yeah. Nah, it, just, it, didn't, it didn't work. It, was, no, it wasn't no, no, my no, favorite. No, it, didn't, it didn't work, bro. It didn't work. It might have been all right like if it was an omelet with other stuff in it as well to throw off the taste. But it was like uh, it was like rich eggs. It or, was, yeah, it was it's, no like, it's like you want some sweet with vanilla. It's like with the eggs, I feel like, you know, sea salt, something savory. Uh, you know, it elevated in that other direction. Yeah. But uh, yeah, the vanilla was throwing me off, bro. I was like, why am I eating cake for breakfast? This is crazy. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, like that creative process in the kitchen, like it, it's inevitable, bro. Like I, I really think as soon as you get in the kitchen, you're like, well, what would this taste like? I put one, one time I put cinnamon in my ground beef just to see what the fuck that would that, do too. That, you could do that with a small amount. Cinnamon it just, goes it was too, a, a far, pinch, a big way. Yeah, right? it was just I mean? a pinch. And uh, yeah, my ex-wife was like, is there fucking cinnamon in the beef? And I was like, yeah, <laughs> check it out. And she was like, no, gross. Nah, like dude. she had eaten like two whole tacos and then decided it didn't taste good after she realized <laughs> it was cinnamon. It seems like your um, your culinary background is Christmas food. <laughs> <laughs> and you're just trying to mix that into like everyday meals you're like maybe a little nutmeg and cinnamon in this bit <laughs> nah dude it doesn't work that it, way. it doesn't work it doesn't work <laughs> all right dude let's get into this Sully. for people that don't know you let's go over it you're an mc you've been making music for the last 20 years um full-on well, producer uh you, you've been doing instrumentals lately but you i mean you did a lot of rapping in the past uh you create art you've you've pretty much done it all huh so, yeah, I mean, when, once you start off and, and you have zero budget whatsoever, you kind of got to just cover all your bases possible so that way you don't have to spend, you know, money. And then next thing you know, you start, it just becomes a part of everything you do. You know, you make the beat, then you're like, well, now I need someone to put some lyrics over it. And so then you start writing and then you're like, okay, this became a song. So now you got to mix it, master it, and then you got to get some artwork together to put it out. And it's all just all that it encompasses itself. So you're just kind of like, I got to get good at this or I got to make some money to pay someone to do this. So right. um, that's kind of how I, that was kind of my mentality when I first started out was just like, okay, I'm doing this, but all this other shit's required. So someone's got to do it. 
So it, and, it, it is a lot of time consuming and especially learning and stuff like that, you know, and, but yeah, it's, it's, you gotta, you gotta know everything. Otherwise you're going to be paying someone to do it. Yeah. And in the, in the music industry, especially it's, if you can do everything yourself and not have to rely on somebody else to make it happen, especially when there's six different things that have to get done for one single to get put out, if you're relying on six different companies or six different people, there's a lot of room for shit to fall between the cracks. Like the more you can take that on yourself and I don't want, I not necessarily DIY, but do the legwork that the company would do for you and make the professional product on your own. That is such a way better place to be in. Cause you don't got to rely on anybody. You can actually make it happen. You're all the way through. Well, that, and you know, where you, you know, where everything's at, you know what I mean? You know, mm-hmm. step by step where it's at. Um, I mean, it's nice when you have outside people and they're saying, Hey, you're forgetting this or you're forgetting that. And it's like, Oh yeah. shit. Okay. But for the most part, you know, everything becomes a routine in any industry you work in same as the music industry, everything's a routine and everything has to have its own structure and, and, and plan. And you have to follow that. Um, so, I mean, once you get it down, you know, it is what it is, but you know, it is nice to have people, but if you don't have them, yeah, it, it is all on you. And it is, I mean, it is DIY the thing is do it yourself. You know, you, but at least you have the, I, I personally, I like more control over my stuff. I like to be able to control what I do and make my own decisions for, for the path of stuff that I've done. Um, so that's the nice part about it. But then sometimes, you know, there are things that you forget or things you don't even think of. Right. You know, that's nice to uh, have outside people with. Kind of give uh, you those standards easy. and boundaries to make sure like cover all your bases. Yeah. I, I can yeah. see that. There's definitely give and take there. When, when did you start uh, like making music? Was it high school or was it before that? Uh, I started, I started, playing guitar in the third grade. Um, only time in my life I've ever gotten straight A's. My mom said, <laughs> if I can get straight A's, she will buy me a guitar. So I doubled down on that bet and I got straight A's and, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. never happened again, <laughs> but I got my guitar. It was a Fender Stratocaster that was made in Japan. Nice. Okay. From the seventies. Damn, so that's a, was, that's actually an expensive was, guitar now. Yeah, it is. It is. Um, because they, from what I understand about the ones that were made in Japan in the 70s, um, they are pretty much the same guitars that was made in America. Um, there was just something slightly, I think it was the pickups that were slightly different. Okay. So if you swapped out the pickups, it was pretty much the same guitar. Nice. If, same if wood. I'm correct, I'd have to actually look more into it. But I, from what I understand, that's what it was. Yeah, I, I if think, you get into the Mexican made ones, the necks are slightly different, I think. Right. Exactly. Right, right. And that's what makes the them Japanese. like half the value. But the Japanese and the American ones, to this day, the older they are, I mean, the more they're worth. Yeah, their value goes up. Yeah, those are the solid, solid built guitars. Do you still have that guitar? I do. Nice. Yeah, I do. <laughs> that's yeah, sick. Uh, I've done some work to it. I've changed out the tuning head, the pegs, changed out the, uh, changed out the pickups, and uh, it's a beast of a guitar. It sounds great. Awesome. So you start playing guitar because you get straight A's and then eventually you transitioned into a, a hip hop career and like moving more into instrumental beats and stuff like that. How'd that happen? Well, um, I was in a band in high school and, uh, he was with one of our foreign exchange students. He was from Brazil and, um, my buddy was with the drummer, but after he got our, our foreign exchange student, he was a singer and a guitar player. I actually at that point trans- transitioned into bass playing. Okay. Um, so um, once he left and went back to Brazil, we were kind of left with this just empty void of a singer and, and a guitar player. So it was kind of, we always, we tried finding other people to, to fill that void, but we just couldn't find anyone. Um, so we each kind of went our own ways separately uh, musically. And um, I started trying to find ways to make music by myself. Cause I had these ideas. I'm like, you know, if I could make drums and if I could do that, you know, this and that I could play my own stuff. I don't need that. I just need a way to record everything and get everything in. So, um, I, you know, at that point in time, my life is that like, things got later into high school. I spent a lot of time in the San Fernando Valley and uh, a lot of my friends were into like EDC music at, mm-hmm. at the time, like a lot of drum and bass and, and hardcore gabber um, style music. 
um, even some old school techno type stuff. And they were, they were making it. So okay. I, they started buying drum machines and, and started playing around those. So I got to start, you know, messing with those, getting comfortable with them. And I was like, well, shit, I can use this as drums and I could put a bass line over it. Or I could put a guitar riff over it or, you know, start simple with it and move on from there. And um, right after high school, I moved out. I moved to Sherman Oaks and I started going to Santa Monica College. And my roommate at the time while I was going to college, he uh, was interested, uh, he was really interested in the computer music. He was working with uh, Hammerhead, Acid, Soundforge. Okay, yeah, um, yeah. Pretty early programs back then. Hammerhead was just, just a basic, simple program where you had, it was a sequencer with four tracks. So once you use your four tracks, you had to export it into Acid and Soundforge and then uh, and then you know make another four tracks and bring it into there. Or I would even just to track it out, just do one track at a time, just import everything into Acid and then you know clean everything up in Soundforge. But so that's kind of how I got to there. And was like, I, I liked making music, but I just wanted to better it from there. And then um, being at Santa Monica, it just reminded me too much like high school. I was like, college just wasn't for me at the time. I wanted something more focused on, um, I wanted something more focused on, on, I guess, more direct learning, sure, yeah. not, not a broad, just here, go take geology or, or U S history. Like I wanted more, like, let's go more music focused. So I looked in the musician Institute and that's how I, got into the recording aspect and, and all that, which just kind of furthered my interest in production. Absolutely. So for those of, uh, those of you listening that don't know, Soli was the main producer and beat maker and also artist uh, of Grim Image, which is the record company that I was on with him there. And he produced and edited and did all of the studio work on the three EPs that came out, uh, that I did, uh, amazing producer amazing ear when it comes to uh being able to like mix drums and then also put everything together um that trans transitions me right into the kind of the next question that i was having or wanted to talk about is all you've been still steady putting out music it seems like every few months you've got another single drop and another instrumental coming out like you're you're still grinding and grinding and grinding even I mean, 20 years later, I, what'd you go to Musicians Institute to in the early 2000s or late 90s, right? And here you are still. I started, I started Musicians Institute at the end of 99. Yeah, okay. Um, I, graduated, I graduated in 2000. Um, so, 20, so 21 years later, you're still grinding out music. Like, how do you keep that going, man? Like, how does that happen? Uh, it's just, you know, being a musician isn't, isn't a, uh, it's not a fad. You know, I, 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 what you make is, is more, it can be flowing with the times better, but as far as just making music, it's, you're going to have this constant beat in your head. You know, yeah. at least I do. I constantly have music flowing through me. Um, and I just, in this type of where I'm at, I, I don't want to put stuff away in the past. I used to just stash stuff, be like, Oh, this, I'm going to put this person on this, or this would sound good with this, or this would sound good over here that now I'm just like, if I make it, um, I might run it by a couple of people just to see if they're interested. And if they're not, then I'm putting it out. For sure. You know, I just, just keep putting it out. It's that's how today's music works. Is you you got to stay relevant. You got to, in, in order to stay relevant, you got to just keep putting out content regardless if it's just one single every three months, every six months, or if it's, uh, you know, an album every year or however, but I, what I'm finding is, is better just to, you know what I mean? To work on both, you know what I mean? Just things you're like, Oh, that's cool. But I don't think it's going to fit with this album, put it out as a single. And then, you know, take the ones that kind of complement each other and set them aside and to a potential album. Yeah. Absolutely. So that you can do, you can, you can appease both both types of people, you know, cause some people just want to hear one song. Some people are like, ah, oh, I want albums. Sure. Yeah. I, I got a question, dude, because, uh, when we first met, you were living, I think Bonnie street was probably when we first met and you guys yeah. were living together over there. And, uh, everyone like in the house was making music it, kind of independently of each other, but also together. 
And I, I want to ask you as someone that's had multiple roommates and like lived in this, uh, this career for this long, does the environment, uh, affect the music more or is it the music that like infects your environment more? Does that make sense? Yeah. I, I mean, well, it, it, I could see it being, uh, both, um, in, in different aspects because yeah, when you hear, when you're around people that are creative, it inspires you to be creative. And when you hear something that they're doing, um, you might be like, wow, I really like how that sounds. Maybe I'll try to make something in, in that type of sound too. Um, so that, that can definitely being around those types of people can definitely inspire you to, to create like, or similar styles of music. Um, just because one, you're hearing it and two, you know, I, it's just the energy when you get around, you mm -hmm. know, different musicians, it's just the energy that, that, that you resonate with, I guess, as far as everyone that's together. Um, but then sometimes, you know, like, you know, the music that I'm personally creating has influenced those around me to, to step outside of what they have done and try to come over and resonate over with what I'm doing. So I think, I think it goes both ways, you know? Yeah. As I was thinking like back in my own, like art kind of like life uh when i'm the most broke or like the most like struggling like i'm working two jobs and like barely making rent because i'm drinking or whatever it is those are the times when i produce the most paintings they might not be the best paintings but it's like it's like that need to like produce something when you're like unsure of your your uh like living situation or like the the consistency around you like have you ever felt that way where it's like I'm just going to make because I got nothing, nothing to lose. Like I might get kicked <laughs> out of this place, like at the end of the month. So I'm just going to create yeah, shit. Yeah. I, 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 no, that's a, that's a great point because it, it, when I've made some of my best stuff, I personally feel like when I'm broke, you know, because it's one is getting my full attention. Cause I don't, I can't afford right. to go out and do anything yet, you know? So I, I don't, I don't have the money to go out and, and it take away from my time. Like I just got, every moment that I'm sitting here is devoted to that. Plus, you know, you're, you get in that mind state to where it's like, you know, you feel that, that burden of not having, you know, money or not having the ability to go out and do necessarily what you want to do life-wise, not to say that music isn't it, but sometimes music is an alternative to a, a, a what's the word productive life or, the ideal life that you'd want to be out. Like if, right, if yeah. I could really, it's the idea. Life. I think it's exactly that. It's the idea of being productive. Like, like there's ways to show that you're doing well, quote unquote. And it's, uh, you know, it's the content you put out or it's the things you do or the things you buy. And when you can't go out or buy shit, it's, it's the content you put out. So it's like music, art, you know, it's like, I'm going to focus on this because what you can create, not what you could buy. Yeah. Because I feel like that, that's what I have to contribute to other people that are looking at me, but that might just be like a, like a self-conscious kind of attitude towards it. Yeah, no, no, I, no, I agree. I agree because you know, that's where I'm, I'm just like, well, I got no money. I got a little bit of stuff in the fridge, so I'm just going to eat that. And then <laughs> yeah, <laughs> do I watch TV? Do I play video games or do I do something that where I can actually, you know, express, still express myself and, and get myself out there in something that could quite be good for my soul. Right. You know, so I'm like, I guess I'll, I'll make some music. And usually at that point in time, I, I make something I'm like, I'm usually glad I did afterwards. I don't feel like I wasted my time. Right? Oh, yeah. I'm like, man, I'm really happy I took the time to do that. And I probably honestly spend a lot more time on that than I do on any of the other alternatives that I could have put my time towards. Right. Well, that's a good point too. Like, the best music, whatever genre comes with from emotion and like deep emotional place. So when you're yeah. down and out, when you're broke, when you got nothing else to do, that's the time when you've got the most emotion stirring up in you too. So to like have the outlet and create a song at the end of the day, you're like, damn, that felt really good to create that song and because like, you're literally like out. therapeutic, yeah. you know, like allowing the music to take something out of you. Yeah. No, completely. And I mean, I, that's, that's with anything, any, any emotion you're feeling, you know what I mean? Cause you figure, you, I mean, a lot of people say the best emotion for music is 
is that type of, you know, down in the gutter feeling or right, the starving you know, artist. But, but it's with anything, it, even a happy, positive emotion. It's just, I think that's just what most people make music or a lot of times is when they're down there. Mm. But when you're, when you're up and you're totally up in life, like the stuff you can make on that too is incredible too. But I just think a lot of people when they're, when they're up on life, they're not making as much music because they're out living life. That's a really and good that's, point. That's a moment that you don't want to miss out on either is, you know, if you find yourself in a, in a position to where you're just extremely high on life, right? like try to make some music because you never know what you're going to make on that either. Absolutely. And I don't think we get enough of that. That's a great point to make, man. Hell yeah. Cause emotions aren't just bad emotion. There's those high, awesome, amazing emotions too. And when you could plug that into a song, shoot, you, I, as an artist, it's almost like a new concept to me. Like, Oh wait, you can make music when you're not down. Like the music yeah. comes out too, when you're feeling good, you know, cause it just seems like the, the emotion that comes out in most tunes, there there's some songs like Pharrell happy, you know, obviously yeah. he wasn't having a bad day when he wrote that song, but 99% of the songs out there, you're like, yeah, I could see that this artist was probably having not a great day when they wrote this song. That's probably, that's a very ironic song right there. He must've been extremely happy to make it until he got sued for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Dude. I believe, I believe they went after him for that. Uh, after they they went after the, um, Robin Thicke song. Yeah. They, the, I don't know. Uh, T.I. and to, Pharrell and Robin Thicke. Yeah. I don't know if they were able to actually get him for happy, but I know they were trying to for something and it didn't even sound like the original sample, but uh, dude, and that part of the music industry is just a, a wild seven headed snake. man. Yo, actually let me touch on this. So <laughs> when I was rolling around in my Honda civic 2001, what's up kids? <laughs> um, I used to bump your CD. It was like the most recent one at the time. I think, I could be wrong, but uh, you had the Pat Benatar, the Love is a Battlefield. Uh, seven sample. Deadly Sins. And, uh, and you were like, oh, I'm going to get sued for this one. Yeah. And I was like, damn, dude, I wonder if, if it ever comes to that level of like suing independent artists for like using a sample like that. But like, have you experienced any of that? I fortunately have not. Um, and I've, I've gotten away with, with a couple. Like one, I sampled a Madonna track, which actually went a lot farther than I was expecting it to. Um, <laughs> it gets a little it's scary. Not one of my favorite tracks, personally, that I've made, but it just, it, I don't know. That's that's the other thing. You never know which ones are gonna go. Right. Like, I fucking hate this track. Right. Next thing you know, it's oh, got that's that's hard, dude. That's hard to like, a T. Yeah, it's crazy. But uh, no, I as far as sampling, I've, I've been very fortunate. Um, nowadays, when I do sampling, I try to disguise it a, a lot more. Um, you really have to dig in it to find that sample, but. Um, Back in the day when, you know, when I first got my, um, my first MPC 2000 XL, you know, I was just, I was just stealing beats, but I mean, that's, that's what, <laughs> that's what hip hop was back then. It yeah. was just, okay, take this loop, bam, loop it. Good. We're running with it. Yeah. And, uh, but no, I, um, that Pat Benatar, that was on a mixtape too. So fortunately, um, that one didn't, didn't get as, uh, any issues with it oh, okay but yeah I've, I've 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 been very lucky because some people some people have yeah. and it's always with the with the intent that hey if i even makes a million dollars you know i always have the intent to pay the artist but just always getting a hold of the right person isn't always the easiest thing to do although That's it's gotten great. a lot easier over the last couple of years as far as there's a lot more uh companies willing to help you try to try to um get a sample cleared basically oh, basically play like middleman to get like a little percentage off of what the the deal is or what is that how does that work um generally what mo i mean it's all going to be on the artist at that point in time and, and the, the distributor um like my buddy sampled a song from george clinton uh years ago and i mean of course george clinton's the most sampled man on the planet right. so <laughs> he doesn't give a shit and my boy so my boy sent him he did send him a little paperwork just you know i have the availability to use this just couldn't sign it and said hey just send me a penny so that's sick he dude shout the penny shout inside out. on the letter gave it to him and he sent the paperwork back signed like who you know but then you know you got people like you know led zeppelin who they don't like you sampling their stuff. Mm. Uh, Neil Young, Neil Young hates it, hates people sampling their stuff. But I've actually sampled some Neil Young. But um, <laughs> so like that type of stuff, you're never gonna get cleared. 
Um, other people are just going to be completely outrageous with it. Um, or some people will be fine with it until the song blows up. You know, if you, right, if right. you get a song out there, it ends up being a hit. Next thing you know, these guys might change their... Come their out with their palms money. up, yeah. But, um, you know, for the most part, you're just gonna you're just either going to pay them an upfront, upfront fee or you're going to agree to some sort of uh, some back-end percentage. Or uh, it might be a little bit of both, like, you know, give me $1,000 up front and then from there give me, you know, 5 10%. Uh, upwards into you know some people some that and this is where sampling gets crazy uh it's it's to where some people be like i want 75 percent of the song <laughs> it's like well i mean you didn't write the song i mean yeah the beat is basically your song flip so i can get that but i mean you didn't write the song you didn't make the hit you didn't make it relevant and there's the thing about sampling which artists kill themselves nowadays by by being against sampling is Oftentimes, when a song blows up with a sample, the original song it's sells an astronomical right. amount of co uh, copies as well now. Yeah. So you're, right. you, you're kind of shooting yourself in your foot if you're going to trip on someone from sampling. But at the same time, I get it. Someone makes a you know a platinum song with your song as the as the background music. You should you should be entitled to something. Yeah, but there's always been that history of songwriters and uh, like major record labels kind of paying them a small percentage um, for the work that they do that tends to be these astronomical hits. You know, a lot of the pop stars from the 60s to today don't write their own songs. And, yeah. there, you know, there's a army of people working behind it today. But before, you know, and say in the 60s, 70s, there's like three or four people that were writing these jams like knocking them out for different artists that were just making a small percentage to like get by and live in New York or whatever. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? It's, it's wild. It's, it's crazy because everyone I gets mean, taken advantage of in this industry. It's, it's doesn't, doesn't matter like who you are yeah. on what level. Yeah. I mean, if you're, if you're Joe Schmoen in your apartment who just writes incredible songs, yeah, you're not going to get, you know, you're, you're going to be lucky to, to barely scrape by. And, and like, then you look at Prince who, I mean, you can go through, in fact, they just recently released something maybe like a year ago, maybe two years ago now of like songs. He, the original recordings of the songs he did to songs he sold. And uh, it just blew my mind. Like it's like a 20 track album of just hit after hit, after hit, after hit that he wrote, but other people performed and, and took and you're like, damn, I had no idea he wrote us. And of course, you know, he's getting paid because he's Prince. Right. But when you look at, all these other people that are writing these hits and they're, they're not getting nothing, you know, it's a tough industry. It happens man. a lot. It happens a lot in, I mean, in every industry, you know, absolutely. Um, that's like with Gilly, the kid and, and uh, little Wayne, I know he wrote a lot of stuff for little Wayne. Um, you know, and then you look at Jay Z, Jay Z wrote a lot of stuff for a lot of people. Uh -huh. Right. Um, I mean, he wrote that, that whole, uh, still Dre with Dr. Dre. And, Does it say, and, uh, is it Jay? Jay Z or and Royce Five Nine like does a bunch of like ghostwriting stuff, yeah. like hits that you would know, and it's like, all right, well, I don't even know who that is. Like a lot of people, you know what I mean? Be like, well, who 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 wrote that? Like, it doesn't make sense. Yeah, it's crazy. So still doing music, still putting out uh, instrumentals, EPs, all of that. Uh, but you're all you've also kind of pivoted. Uh, into a lot of other directions lately it seems um i most obvious from following you on instagram and knowing you is uh shoe wednesday right like you that that's like shoe wednesday. turning into kind of a big deal bro it's well it's um basically me and uh me and two max we're, we're getting ready to launch we're both we're both love shoes and um I'm going to hit this real quick. I'm going to tell you because it's just one of those long stories. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. We'll throw the Don't. elevator music in. Ding, 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 <laughs> ding. Right. the girl from Hiroshima. So, Look it up. Basically, <laughs> Shoe Wednesday started. Um, Two Max is a good friend of mine. Uh, we we met on um, Grim Image Records. Um, basically, we were on the same label and uh, we started, we, we did a lot of interaction, did some recording for him, stuff like that. Never really worked with him much. Uh, it all came down to South by Southwest where 
Um, I had to take a piss and uh, there was nowhere to park. So we parked the van in this um, burger spot across the street, which of course had a no parking sign in it. We were in the building for long enough for me to take a piss and walk out, which was maybe five minutes. And we got our van towed. So in the process of trying to get our van back from the towing, we had to wait for a notary, which was going to take about six hours to get us. So at that point in time, we, uh, we got to know each other real well, sitting outside in the dirt in this uh, <laughs> tow yard, waiting for a notary to come so we could get our van. And ever since then, we've just been we've been close homies. He's helped me out a lot, and uh, I help him out however I can too as well. He's a great um, guy. And with like that, with that, he uh, had a streak of luck. Um, was doing quite well money wise at the time, as far as um. um his side businesses and then um he just went and tested his luck at the casino and came up so i was <laughs> having a really bad i was having i was at a really low point um just during that point i was i was, I was struggling with some family issues and, and some other issues and stuff like that and just uh just life as getting older you just i don't know it takes a toll on you mentally mm-hmm. and I, I was just at a low point and he came down and he came in came to the house and was like hey uh you know, I just hit at the casino real big. I'm like, oh, okay, that's good. I'm broke as shit. Good for you. <laughs> and uh, he was like, man, he goes, fuck this shit. You're in a funk. You're, you know, let's let's get you. What do we got to do? You want to go get some shoes? He's like, I want to go get some shoes. You want to go get some shoes? I was like, you know, I want to go get some shoes. Yeah, so, <laughs> come on, over. Yeah. So we went, we went and got some lunch because he comes down every week. And we and uh, you know, we. Well, we, he works on some NFT stuff, which we'll, we'll get into. Oh, yeah. But um, uh, we went to lunch, then we went and got some shoes. And then the next week, I was still kind of bummed out. So he came down, and he's like, man, I want another pair of shoes. He's like, I'm like, yeah. He's like, I know you want one. So it ended up being just this thing where, like, he was trying to use shoes to uplift me mm. and and better my, better my life at the moment. So we went and got another pair of shoes and we just started thinking about like we we enjoy the process it's good for him because he needs to get out and he needs to walk around right, right so just going out to the mall walking from one end all the way back up and sometimes we'll double back like if i see something at at shoe palace and i'm like i don't know if it's at foot locker yet because we haven't made it down there i want to go to foot locker we're gonna walk out of foot locker and i'll be like Man, I really saw something nice at Foot Locker, but that that one shoe at Shoe Palace, we got to go back down there. So we'll walk back down there. I'm like, I want that shoe at Shoe Palace. Back, like, you want to have it in your size? All right. Like, all right, shit, we got to double back up to Foot Locker. Yeah, and then maybe hit Lick just to check out. We call that the Shoe Museum because we're not buying shit in there. <laughs> yeah, four hundred dollars for a pair of Jordan ones. You know, what I mean, no matter how dope they are, but it's just nice to see some of the shoes that you don't get to buy because the the bots are out of control on sneakers or whatever Mm -hmm. Uh, so you'll go in there and be like man i really wanted this shoe i'm not gonna pay for it but it's nice to see it in person you know so anyway long story short about that um what we're doing on it is is we're gonna be starting and we were supposed to start it this next week but um two x was involved in a uh in a lift accident a couple, couple months back um so he has to finish up some some doctor um, stuff on there. Um, so we're going to push it back to about another two weeks. I think we're looking at like mid November. Uh, what it is, it's a shoe club for shoe heads, just like us. And as we go out and get our shoes every Wednesday, because it's become this every Wednesday thing to where we just go get shoes. Um, some weekends he's buying them. Some weekends I'm buying them. Some weeks we're both buying them. Um, just to clarify for everyone. Yeah, uh, but you know, like uh, the the first week, there was one week where he was supposed to have a surgery, and he's like, "We can't do shoe Wednesday." And it was like the first shoe Wednesday we couldn't do a shoe Wednesday, so I was like, "Nah, fuck that." So I, I went on Adidas dot com. I ordered some shoes for both of us, Dope. and uh, and so like I sent him the message when I thought he was gonna be in surgery, so that way he could wake up from his surgery and be like, "Oh shit, we still did shoe Wednesday," but he ended up not not uh, actually doing surgery that day so he was kind of bummed out but then you know because to prep for the surgeries and stuff is so mentally draining so he was kind of bummed you know you just wanted to get it over with but then like 
seeing see me text him like the the pics of the shoe he was like it kind of made his day so that that's just what it's been but what we're doing translating once again long story short uh it's, it's translating into um a shoe club for shoe heads where it's gonna be five bucks a month and you will have four opportunities or, or however Wednesdays there are in that month. Cause I know someone, I think there might be months where maybe there might be five Wednesdays or right. maybe three Wednesdays, depending on the month. But within that month, that's the amount of times five bucks, how many opportunities you'll have to win a pair of shoes. And we're going to cap it off at about, I think 2000 people. Um, so once, and we may even do two people once we hit 2000, I don't know. We're still working out that those details. Cause I'm sure it's going to start up a little slowly, but basically if people want a free pair, a shot at a, getting a free pair of shoes. Now we can't guarantee that they're going to be Jordan ones every time or limited crazy Jordan dunks or, you know, or, or, or you know, whatever we can't, right. we can't do that. What we, what we, and I said, Jordan dunks, I know someone's going to be like, oh, <laughs> Jordan dunks, but, uh, uh <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> better edit that out. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but you know, it's, it's just going to be whatever we find. So that, and that, cause that's how we, sh- we go yeah. and whatever's in the store at the time, we're going to find the dopest shit. That's, that's what we do. Oh yeah. Right. So, and if there's been times we've gone to the, to like our local mall, we, we swap between, we go to Inland center a lot. We'll go to the century city mall a lot. We've got a nice kicks. Um, we'll go out to Ontario mills. And honestly, I think Ontario mills is some of the best selection for shoes. Like if you want okay. fucking like shoes, you don't find anywhere else for some reason. Ontario Mills is is like the best bet. So that that's my tip of the day for anyone looking for shoes. Are you go to Ontario heads? Mills? There's the if they don't have it on Ontario California Mills, you probably can only get it online. Um, but and, and we're still looking at other spots, and we want to like incorporate food with it. It's gonna be like a shoe blog, food blog, uh, weekly contest to win shoes. So oh. we're, uh, it's is what we do every Wednesday. We go out, we find good food, then we go out and find dope shoes. So. That's yeah, that's sick. That. Dude, that I love a long explanation. I love how that came to be. Like there there's nothing better than when something gets started, an opportunity gets hatched out of a homie trying to help a homie. You know what I mean? And and using shoes to uplift someone. Like I dude, I'm not a sneakerhead. So when you're like, yo, he's like, I want to buy a new pair of shoes two weeks in a row, three weeks in a row, I'd have been like, all right, come on, homie. Like you ain't got to do all this for me. You know what I mean? It would have been so obvious, but in, in that, in that sneaker world, that's normal, you know, like, Hey, it's a, it's a new week. I need a new pair of shoes. I'm going to go grab some kicks. And the fact that look, we, we know, i I know two max too. Alex is a great dude, man. Like he's just got a heart of gold and always has anybody that's met him can, will testify that the dude is just nice. He's a nice fucking guy. And he goes out of his color probably. Yeah. 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 (laughs) No, he's, I I wasn't going to say anything. (laughs) Okay. So there might be one or two people that, that got bad words about two mix, but that is very few, man. Very few and far between the dude is just, he's, he's always looking out for people. And bro, I remember, uh, I was, I have a, a song with two mechs on one of my albums or one of my EPs that I did that you facilitated. Cause he was over there recording some stuff and you were like, Hey, we're recording for MCJC too. Would you be down to hop on a track? I didn't even have any, like anything ready, but you just like, and he agreed. And I was like, dude, I, I can't afford anything. I'm, I'm a starving artist. I'm broke as hell. And he goes, you know what? I'm out here from LA. I'm going to stay the night and be here for a couple of days. You give me a phone charger. I'll do this track for you. And I legit like ran to Seven Eleven and bought him a, a cord and a plug for his phone, whatever kind of phone he had, brought it back to the pad. And he was like, dope. And I got 16 bars from the guy. Yeah. Like that's the kind of guy two mechs is. Hell so yeah. to see something like shoe Wednesday pr- prosper out of that, that part of the heart, it's like, that's where true, true concepts come from. When you're not trying to create something, when you're just being a good person, and then karma kind of kicks in and goes, you know what? I'm gonna water this and turn it into something a little bit better. That's just so bitching to hear. We were all very fortunate at that point in time because I mean, now now it's a little differently on his. Uh, I mean, he's still the same good person, but just as far on the music end, um, and and rightfully so, he's asking a lot more than a phone charger. Right. But, uh, oh yeah, as he should. So. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, you know, that's that's that, and, and that's a great story for you know. 
I mean, I, I love that for your experiences. You know, what did it what did it cost to get him on track? Phone charger. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. You well, and that's, mean, that's because that's it, it was you, bro. We were at your house in your studio. Like you facilitated the whole thing. So that's what I'm saying. It's not like I was some random dude, stranger to, stranger to everyone, walking up and getting that deal. But it was because he he respects you, the respect that you guys, the reciprocal relationship that you guys had. He seen me as your homie and was like, yeah, I, I got you, bro. Be- almost to hook you up. He hooked me up and gave me this awesome fucking story and an amazing track. Yeah. I mean, I wish I could tell, I wish I could tell like really just go above and beyond and say, but there's some things I just can't, yeah, I, can't yeah. <laughs> you know, I can't tell online. You know what I mean? But there's, uh, some stories I have to save till after the funeral. After a funeral, hopefully, hopefully he outlives me. Though shit, you know. What I mean? But, uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, it, there's just you, some. It's like Vegas. Some things what stays in there in your head stays in your head. I guess. Yeah. I but well, uh, he well, is, God he bless is a you, great dude. Yeah. Uh, and uh, nowadays, it's it's a lot harder for him to to get around to do shows and stuff like that, and, and to record for people. So. Um, Everyone that has a track with them, they like they're they're fortunate. They're very fortunate. Me, me myself included, because it's even getting hard. Like, uh, we are working on a project at very slow speed. It's kind of just like it's going to be one track at a time, and it's going to take us probably a couple of years to finish it. But eventually, hopefully, when it's done, there will be a Sully and Two Max album. So those uh, labors of love are Max, awesome. Or more pro- appropriately said, a Two Max album produced by Sully. There you go. Um, there you go. Well, that that's like but, the Candies uh, album that we 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 interviewed uh, exist uh, last, season last season or whatever. Yeah. And the first like twenty episodes, and he was talking about an album that they probably worked on it for like three years, shopped it around five different times. Nothing came of it. They produced it kind of like independently and just put it out, and it's been like pretty fruitful. And it's like you you don't know how long these labors of love are gonna take because it's not. It's not, there's not a schedule set forth by a, a bigger than you company that's like, all right, this is when we're recording. This is when we're going to get uh, bounced down. This is when it's going to drop. This is when we got, this promote. is how long we're going to market right. it. Yeah. And that's all you get. That's, a, that's it. But like you work on something for over time uh, organically and it, it seems to be like the better process and a lot of shit, you know? Yeah. It's it's like when when we do shoe Wednesday now. Like yesterday, he didn't grab any shoes because they didn't have the dunks he wanted in his size, and it uh, because they sold out so fast. But um, um, I ended up getting a pair. But for him, the way the way he we're looking at this project is the way that we do shoe Wednesday now. It's like if we walk into a store and I don't see something that absolutely just jumps out at me that right. I'm like I fucking love this thing. We got so many damn shoes now. We're like I don't need <laughs> to fill that with something that I just don't absolutely love. Yeah. Um, so we're going about this project like the same way I'm playing on beats. He's like, I like this beat. I like this beat, this beat, st- this, uh, this one too. I'm like, yeah, but do you love it? And he's like, it's cool. I'm like, he's, I'm like, I, he's like, I can do something to it. I'm like, I oh, know you can do something to it, but do you love it? Mm, right. And so, and, and that's where he's like, yeah. So we want to do something differently to where it's kind of, he loves every track Dope. and um, that takes time. That, that takes a lot of time. Yeah, it takes time. yeah. Cause I mean, it, and that's the thing about production and being a producer, you, you got to understand that, that one person may not love it, but you may give it to someone else and they may fucking absolutely, they may be the best beat they've ever heard. Right. Someone else may be the worst beat they've ever heard, but you just can't take that person. Right. Um, you just keep moving on. And so, so that's how I've been doing. I'll, I'll, I'll make a beat. I'll email it to him. Like, Check this out. What do you think? They'd be like, it's cool. Okay. I'm putting it up online. You're not getting it. <laughs> yeah. But if he's like, he's like, man, I really, really like this. But right now he's working on it. We're, we're working on a track and the song we're working on is it's something that's going to take a little bit of time to write because of the, of the subject and just to do it right and super dope. So he's taking his time with it. So I can't really throw anything at him right now. Cause when I do, he's just like, Oh, but I'm on this beat right now. Yeah. And like, okay. I get it. You know, I, and I don't want to take him off. And I don't want to detract from, from his attention on that one either, because I know if I let him do his thing, it's going to come out. It's going to come out amazing. So oh, yeah. that's right. the way you want to be I'm stoked doing. on that, to, to be working on that. And, um, you know, he kind of, he got me into the NFTs as well. Um, yeah, are you guys working on, kind of, are you guys working on the NFT project like together? Is that the two of you or how's no, that I'm going? More like, I'm more like just a, uh, 
just a uh, employee, a, 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 an independent contractor for for when they need certain things. Okay. Gotcha, as far gotcha, as them, okay. but they they actually have their own uh, investor, um, and a well a well one, and then two max are on a on contract uh, for the for the NFT group uh, Secret Savers, Secret Savers of Underground Hip Hop. Yeah, yeah, for, that's like a yeah. what nineties. Early two thousands. What? How how old is that? Um. Well, that they're they're kind of shooting for that era of of MCs. Like, um. Well, it's like the airliner they, cats from Project be, Load and all that, actually. right? They uh because they're doing se- they're starting season two right now. Um. The first season was like Idea, Gift to Gab, um. Uh, the Shapeshifters, Tumex, Nayla, uh, Bluebird, um, uh. Uh, man, have a so wait, the wait. teacher on uh, sleep, sleep. Um, and they had a couple others with the boom box. Can, uh, can you explain the project though? Is it, I mean, is it is it? It's not a podcast. Is a it's a it's a NFT. So it's strictly strictly NFT. It's strictly it's, like a piece of art, like a piece of the block some, a blockchain digital yeah, yeah, art, something right? that no one else can get their hands on. You you're correct. Uh, intellectual property as far as uh digital property i guess i mean how how does that get classified basically what uh they have the, they have the investor who's uh and then he's he's running a lot of the um their their telegram and he's basically the one he's the man behind the scenes making the moves like on the business side of things right. but then you got tumex who is the one like coordinating the artists like getting the licensing from because they they also did um cool Keith on the last one. So, you know, he's reaching out to every artist, um, dealing with the contracts, negotiating with them as far as which artists are going to do per series. And then you've got AOL one who's supplying all the art, um, okay. yep. and, and animation for, for the cards. Sick. Um, so that, that's kind of how they all fit in on their, uh, as far as their positions for the company. Right. Like how then, something gets um, done, but they've had me do, like a special, a special drop. Like I did, a, they did a collaboration with um, a group called uh, Pizzeria Rusticana, which is like an online NFT game all based around pizza. Okay. So they had me ask me if I could write a song about pizza for a collaboration that they did. So the first song that I've done and like recorded with lyrics, like where it's my own song in like the last maybe four years, five years. Wow. Yeah. It, was song, it was a song about pizza. So, yeah. Yeah. pizza gang <laughs> it was called a uh, it was called pizza boss it was an nft and to my surprise it sold out awesome so you can't even you can't even buy it and uh, wow. I, I was fortunate that I, I was like should i just be that guy to buy my own nft and i did and i'm glad i did because i can't even buy it now nobody wow can. dude sold out so, so they, and, and now they're don't... trying to get me to do do some more projects so i'm, I'm kind of stoked about that um, we were going to do something for Halloween, but my, my schedule just wouldn't permit it. Mm-hmm. Um, but we're looking at some other potential drops in the future here, uh, with music base and, and, uh, for, for their group, the secret savers and for uh pizzeria restaurant. Sick. That's dude. bitching, dude. That's really cool. Yeah, dude. I, and it, I they had like the pizzeria restaurant has like a ridiculous amount of followers too. Like I, I just thought it was some guy from Italy hitting me up. Uh, <laughs> I was like, oh, great. 10 people are going to hear this, but he's got quite a big following. So, like, uh, I, was, I was surprised about that. Uh, That's and the really artwork cool. was out of control. Um, Sick. It was Stochi, Stochi Studios or Stochi Designs. I, I'm, I feel bad for not knowing it off the top of my head. I have to look it up, but he did really dope art for it. So, basically, it's just, it would just be like anything if you went on iTunes, just a little cover art with, um, and then you actually open up the NFT. Um, to where you can see the information on it and it has the song on there where it plays. All right. oh, okay. All right. But, but that's tight. It, I do believe that NFTs are the future of music um, simply because of what was going on with the whole Tory Lane situation where he put one out and uh, I mean, he capped it at a million, sold them for a dollar. They sold all a million in one day, made a wow. million dollars in one day. And he gets 10% off the back end when his, when his uh, people sell it because he encouraged his fans to buy more than one. So let's say you have 10 bucks, you buy 10 FTs, now you got 10 copies of the album. Now that all million have sold, you can't buy them. The only place you can sell those NFTs right. at are 
through the through the people that bought them. It's, mm-hmm. I mean, for lack of a better example, it's like buying ten copies of the first pressing of the White Album, and then you exactly. have those, and you know you might open one, and you got nine to fuck with, and it's gonna make you some dough. <laughs> yeah, you know what? Now, now let's say say you bought one for one dollar. You got the other nine that you bought for one dollar. You can sell them for, I mean, ten bucks a piece, and make you know ninety bucks, or you can sell them for a million dollars a piece, and who knows, maybe make nine million dollars. Yeah, yeah. It only know. takes one person to buy it at sixty grand to uh, make it worth it. You know what That's I mean? Right. So it's like, exactly. All right, and people but are then, fucking paying it. I just saw Buster Rhymes tweeting, "Should I buy a house or this hundred and fifty two dollar hundred fifty thousand dollar NFT?" And it's like, all right. <laughs> Obviously, you should buy a house, Busta, but who knows? I don't know. Well, Dude. I mean, you buy that hundred fifty thousand dollar NFT, you might be able to sell it for a million. You don't know. You know what I mean? That's one day. Right yeah, now. One That's crazy. Day. Cluster Rhymes was the owner. Dude, none of it. You know, it doesn't make sense to me at all. It's like going to the casino, and I'm just like, uh, twenty on red. You know what I mean? Like, I'm a, I'm a simple guy when it comes to that kind of shit. So when people talk about these NFTs, especially in the art world, because they've become so prevalent in the last year. It's fucking mind blowing to me, dude. Like it's wild what? that people are making this kind of money off of this idea that I don't quite comprehend yet. Yeah. I don't think anyone's really supposed to understand it. I think there's some <laughs> pieces of it that are just supposed to remain a mystery. And that's the, that's the way it adds to the value of it. Yeah, I guess I so. It's, it's, it's like crypto. So much, I mean, it's the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. It is just a dog coin or whatever. It's Doge like coin. whatever you want to put your money in, that shit might pay off. I don't know how it works, but you might get paid. It's just, it, it's just, people got to like it. You got It's, it's modern day. It's a modern day art. Yeah. So you're going to have yeah. artists that like, whether it be Michelangelo, Rembrandt, you know, any other fam Picasso, you know what I mean? It's just modern day outlet for the art. Right. Instead of going right. to some art gallery, now you can just go to an NFT marketplace and, and well, and the blockchain really it, it guarantees that there's going to be some value there, or even if it loses all value, there was a value assigned to this, and it can be virtually like tagged and ID'd and made sure that it's an authentic piece, right? So that it's yeah, it's to me it's the same reason that the picture on a twenty dollar bill is different than the picture on a hundred dollar bill because we say we assign a value to that face that's on there, and only because of the value and the the chain of command that goes down with with the dollar or the twenty dollar or hundred dollar bill, that's what gives it the value. So the NFT, I could take a screenshot of that hundred and fifty thousand dollar NFT that Busta Rhymes had, but because it doesn't have that blockchain value behind it, right. it's not then it doesn't up. it doesn't mean right. anything. Yeah, you can yes. look at the picture all you want, but it's just like getting a fake Banksy off the internet. Like it's not a a true thing. So I I think the way it's going to start going is it's going to start being able to, to identify and, and prove the source of that digital media where right now, before that, there's really no way to do that. Yeah. And really, and and that's where blockchain blockchain is going to take off in a whole new direction because of this. I mean, it already is. Right. Um, But because it, this is just the most worthless application of blockchain so far. Sure. Yeah, it's gonna get deep. Like, yeah. Just to just to put it simple, it's but like it's which, genius too. Which, though it has so much more potential. Right. You know? Right. Which is scary. Well, I, which I is a little scary. Art. I love it. Yeah, know, but, we'll see. Dude, as an artist, you know that's like all you can hope for is that you can make some some money off your art and it's legitimate and uh, you know it's more than just a one time thing or it's something that has potential for the future that you're kind of investing in yourself by doing Mm -hmm. and that's what this kind of platform i guess if you want to call it that whatever uh has the the power to do Mm -hmm. um whereas before we were all just kind of you know stumbling around the dark trying to meet people trying to do stuff on our own using the internet but really what does that pay off it's not making you any money well and plus let's say i created a piece of artwork a digital artwork for whatever and then i have to send it over to a printer or i have to send it over to this guy like they now have the original file that they can make copies of and print all right. of my media and it's the same and it doesn't matter if somebody's got that file they can print it in, off in 10 years yeah. i've had one person send me a non-disclosure with their file and I've printed shit for hundreds of people. Yeah, you nobody, know what I mean? do, you nobody know what gives I'm a saying? shit. 
Yeah. If I wanted to, I could just be bootleg Bart, dude. I could just be bootlegging <laughs> every fucking file. But, you know, obviously there's a, the code of like morals and ethics that comes into play in that. And I wouldn't do that. But only, you know, one person who also fucks with NFTs has been the only person to send me a non-disclosure yeah. with their artwork. Yeah. You know? So it's smart. I mean, I mean knows, I, I'm yeah. not dogging on it by any means. I just don't understand it. I, I fucking know, dude. Yeah. I, and, and like you said, everything comes to moral ethics. I, one time I, we had to go see one of my groups years ago was about to uh, sign a deal with a management firm, um, but they were based out of Oregon. So we went and talked to a lawyer, an entertainment lawyer out of Palm Springs who used to represent all the old time guys. Like, I think he even represented, uh, uh, what's the guy who's got his uh, name, Bob Hope. I think yeah, he even Bob represented Hope. Bob Hope back in the day. Like, um, but he said, and he gave me the best legal advice anybody's ever given me. Is it, it, it goes back to moral and ethics? Is it doesn't matter how what you how ironclad that uh, your contracts may be with people. Um, it all depends on the person. Yeah. So you know, you saying you you've received these things, and, and you know you you've kept your honorable word. You could have, but you know, and that's but now the blockchain makes it to where it's an exact fact like when you mm -hmm. when you send stuff out because you can it's all public information you can right. see all that right um the record but of yeah it. like you 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 could take someone's nft and and reprint it but you would be able to still go back and know that it's a fake based by his blockchain um place in the blockchain as far right. as where where these originals these real ones were at and then these ones over here now that's not right those ones so those are even still even if you thought you could make some money. Yeah, you could probably do one, two, maybe more than that, a few more than that into buying it if it was, you know, something where it was like a million dollar NFT or even a hundred thousand dollar NFT. Um, but anyone that is experienced in the NFT world would be like, well, wait a second, that doesn't match up. You're right. right. Yeah. So, yeah. It, and that's why blockchain is great. Yeah, that's why, it, you know, it, why its application, it's still, it, it hasn't reached its full potential yet. Mm -hmm. People can learn, people go. can learn to forge a signature on a print and make money off that print um, if they can scribble like the artist could scribble. And now I'm not saying that's easy, but that's easier uh, to do than going through a chain of buying and selling that is a recorded history of that product. You know, so with that blockchain, it's like there's absolutely no fooling where it came from, where it went to, whose hands it's in. You know, it's yeah, at that it's point completely only, different. Only one NFT yeah. can take up one line of code, and there's no way to make that one line into two lines of code to create a new NFT. Right. So if it's in on different code, then it's not the original, right? That's kind yeah, of the way I understand it. Yeah, right? it's it's a one a one off file. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And generally, if you saw it, you're going to see where the, the it's coming from in the source. Who's who was the source? Who minted this NFT? You're going to see that it's it's. Mm branded on there forever it's not going anywhere gotcha. so you see like oh uh nft king over here made the original and you're like okay so everything from nft king is awesome then here's nft joe schmo and you're like wait a second how did joe schmo get that shit yeah nft king over here like the, that that's it's, it all it, it all works itself out and that's why I think, I mean, eventually music is going to be, it's going to take over for music. And it already kind of is. Although Tory Lanez, he claims to be the first person that, that put out it. But actually, I saw Kings of Leon do it first. Wow. Um, and then Weezer did it and failed miserably. Like, Weezer's drop was <laughs> terrible. Oh, no. <laughs> like, they should have focused more on music than, like, just weird abstract art cards and stuff like that. Mm. But uh, I, from to my knowledge, and I'm sure... I'm I'm sure that in, uh, Kings of Leon wasn't even the first either, but I think they were the first major label band to like um, put, to yeah really, to make it worth it to kind of like set the precedent. Yeah, yeah. But then Tory, but Tory Lanez was the one to really just because a lot of people had no clue that Kings of Leon did it, so that's the difference. But right. Kings of uh, but Tory Lanez blew it open to where he was like, I'm doing it, and now like you got Eminem um and russell simmons they got together i think they bought their own company or maybe i'm getting two different companies mixed up but there's there's a lot of uh big music people getting into nfts now um in fact they're building nft players music players um that's where it's going so once one yeah. of those drops and it actually works functionally like 
any other music player device, uh, iTunes, you know, Spotify, anything like that, you're going to see NFTs just kill the game because now, now you really don't need a record company. You just need to reach people to buy NFTs and you, all the money goes directly to you. And, um, and then say like, say someone sells your NFTs and say they sell it for a million dollars. What are, you can set your back end price, right? So you can set it at say like, I want ten percent from every so you sale. So you're still right. getting so hundred grand off for a million dollars. That's another hundred thousand dollars in your pocket. It's right. it's the uh, OnlyFans. It's the OnlyFans <laughs> for artists. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Really is. <laughs> bring it, bring it direct to the consumer, baby. Yeah. We're gonna give you raw, uncut. <laughs> yeah, and, I, and that's why I can totally see it. Like once and. and and I know people are watching Tory Lanez right now because I know he's getting ready to do more, but I know that's the point to where, like, when you start seeing Drake or when you start seeing, like, another that big size artist really jump into it, it's the music industry, that's when it's really going to change. Right. But I think a lot of these artists, these larger artists, um, are kind of being discouraged to do it because then you would be cutting out these major labels. And a lot of these people have, you know, with that comes a lot of jobs potentially being lost and all sorts of stuff like that. So sure. I think they try to, it's like the movies where with the movie theaters, you know, yeah. like if COVID didn't kill the movie theaters, what will probably nothing because they've, they've been backing the, the movie world so long. So the movies is just going to try and keep them around as long as possible. Too. Right. Gotcha. Yeah. But now that we got Netflix and HBO max, and, you know, there's a whole lot more people that are going to be getting their movies from, from those spots just like music may potentially go to these NFT uh, communities like Atomic Hub and uh, uh, what's, there's a couple other ones out there. Word. Bro, well, thank you for the NFT 101. I appreciate <laughs> yeah. that. That yeah, was, yeah, that was people interesting. People always ask me, I'm like, bro, I, don't, I cannot type all this shit out right now. Yeah, <laughs> we'll so just like, point them to this I'm, episode, bro. Yeah. yeah Shine some light on it for sure. Yeah, shout out Neil at Method Makers that we inter uh, yeah. interviewed in the first season too, and he, he had a lot to like say about it. And yeah, if you're you know, interested in it. learning about NFTs, listen to the Neil Neil episode and listen to this solely episode because this is the one. Hell yeah! Hey, appreciate you being here, bro. It was great seeing you. We got to kick it. Right. I know we're just up the freeway from each other. Haven't seen you in a minute, but we got to catch up, bro. Oh, definitely, definitely. Yeah, dude. I'm I'm glad to see you, man. It's been too long. Seriously, even if it's just. Bullshitting over the internet is good to see you, man. It's good to see you too. I, I honestly, I, I owe you a Nicole breakfast because I, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have a job without. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so I, I, I owe you guys something, lunch, something, whatever. Come out to so, the desert, bro. Come out to the desert on one of your days off. We'll fucking kick it. We'll jump in the pool. We'll go get breakfast. Yeah, be dope. I'm down. I'm definitely down. Dope. Dope, well, man. thanks again, Sully. Anything you want to promote? You want to tell everybody where they can find your Instagram yeah, and all your music on, and all that. Wednesday, yeah, on, drop it yeah. off. Let me get some stuff here. Yeah, quick. get the I stuff, like dude. Yeah. Fucking get the stuff. Getting the products. So, online, I got, I dropped my bro, most recent album is uh, Mania. Man, well, that's the most recent real album. And then before that, I had uh, Drums and Roses. That was a good both one. Both albums, check them out. They're, they're on uh, pretty much every major site, iTunes, Amazon, uh, Spotify. Uh, you can also check out my Bandcamp. Uh, I just go direct link to Sully Music, S U L L Y M U Z I K dot com, and it'll take you to my band camp. Otherwise, it's Sully Music dot band camp dot com. Um, but yeah, I'm always dropping stuff on there, and I drop it. If something drops on, let's say, a Friday, it's going to drop on Thursday on my band camp. Um, so cool. Just because I appreciate people uh, appreciating or promoting my, we start that over. I appreciate <laughs> people uh, supporting my independent. Uh, side of music but yeah, i do understand it's, sometimes it's a lot easier just to go on itunes and amazon or spotify or whatever it is plus that helps me out as an artist because now you have actually projected numbers that people follow so um either way either way you got to get my music check it out um i just released also a track called um um damn what did i call it back back uh back to the back to the future but uh <laughs> I can't even remember what it's called, but you'll you'll see it on there. It looks like Back to the Future. Uh, <laughs> Love it. And um, it's it's basically twenty year old beats, and oh, for some shit. reason that album took off like crazy. I I just throw it out there. I was like, these beats are twenty years old. I've been sitting on them. I didn't put them out. 
and I'm just going to throw them up there. And that, see how that's the instrumental. There. That's the instrumental yeah. you just dropped. Okay. They're all instrumentals. Yeah, we'll and make they get yeah, a great response. So we'll make sure to put all the descriptions um, in the link dude, or the links in the description of this and, you know, make sure it's all, all, uh, accessible. I'm a terrible artist. I can't remember the name of my own album, but it's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, anyway, and then I'm working on a project that's going to be dropping soon. It's going to drop first as an NFT. It's going to be called beyond the complex, but it will eventually, uh, go online. But it's going to be slightly different as far as the NFT release versus the the online release, um, just to keep the NFT its own its own thing. But look okay. out for that; it's going to be coming probably in the next month or two here. So, awesome! Sick, and then uh, you can find me on Instagram at Subly Music and Music. Pretty much everywhere on the internet, I try to keep it at Subly Music, so you can look for me there. Otherwise, uh, yeah, SubtlyMusic.com. Awesome. You heard it first. Great to see you, bro. Let's get together, have a beer soon. We head out to the desert, have a swim, whatever. Either way, man, yeah, let's dude. kick it. I'm down. Yeah, man. I'm down. It's awesome. nice seeing you, dude. Thank you so much for doing this with us. Appreciate you. Oh, no problem. Anytime. Anytime. Awesome. Oh, yeah. We'll be in touch. All right. Yeah. All you guys right. take care. You Peace. too, bro. This has Peace. been another episode of the Ratness Podcast. You can catch us every Friday on YouTube for the videos. Google, Spotify, Apple for all the streaming and Ratnest Sticker Co. for any art, prints, stickers, uh, I don't know, NFTs, whatever you want. <laughs> uh, we'll see you next week. And Jim? Hi, I'm Jim. Bye. <laughs>